A City Near Centaurus by Bill Doty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. A City Near Centaurus by Bill Doty. The city was sacred, but not to its gods. Michelson was a god, but far from sacred. crouched in the ancient doorway like an animal peering out from his burrow mr michelson saw the native at first he was startled thinking it might be someone else from the earth settlement who had discovered the old city before him then he saw the glint of sun against the metallic skirt and relaxed he chuckled to himself wondering with amusement what a web-footed man was doing in an old dead city so far from his people some facts were known about the people of alpha centaurus too they were not actually natives he recalled they were a colony from the fifth planet of the system they were a curious people some were highly intelligent though uneducated he decided to ignore the man for the moment he was far down the ancient street a mere speck against the sand there would be plenty of time to wonder about him he gazed out from his position at the complex variety of buildings before him some were small obviously homes others were huge with tall frail spires standing against the pale blue sky square buildings ellipsoid spheroid beautiful dream-stuffed bridges connected tall conical towers bridges that still swung in the wind after half a million years late afternoon sunlight shone against ebony surfaces the sands of many centuries had blown down the wide streets and filled the doorways desert plants grew from roofs of smaller buildings ignoring the native mr michelson poked about among the ruins happily exclaiming to himself about some particular artifact marveling at its state of preservation holding it this way and that to catch the late afternoon sun smiling clucking gleefully he crawled over the rubble through old doorways half filled with the accumulation of ages he dug experimentally in the sand with his hands like a dog under a roof that had weathered half a million years of rain and sun then he crawled out again covered with dust and cobwebs the native stood in the street less than a hundred feet away waving his arms madly mr earth god he cried it is sacred ground where you are trespassing the archaeologist smiled watching the man hurry closer he was short even for a native long gray hair hung to his shoulders bobbing up and down as he walked he wore no shoes the toes of his webbed feet dragged in the sand making a deep trail behind him he was an old man you never told us about this old dead city michelson said chidingly shame on you but never mind i've found it now isn't it beautiful yes beautiful you will leave now leave michelson asked acting surprised as if the man were a child i just got here a few hours ago you must go why who are you i am keeper of the city you michelson laughed then seeing how serious the native was said what makes you think a dead city needs a keeper the spirits may return michelson crawled out of the doorway and stood up he brushed his trousers he pointed see that wall built of some metal i'd say some alloy impervious to rust and wear the spirits are angry notice the inscriptions wind has blown sand against them for eons and rain and sleet but their story is there once we decipher it leave the native's lined weathered old face was working around the mouth in anger michelson was almost sorry he had mocked him he was deadly serious look he said no spirits are ever coming back here 
don't you know that and even if they did spirits care nothing for old cities half covered with sand and dirt he walked away from the old man heading for another building the sun had already gone below the horizon coloring the high clouds he glanced backward the webfoot was following mr earth god the webfoot cried so sharply that michelson stopped you must not touch not walk upon not handle your step may destroy the home of some ancient spirit your breath may cause one iota of change and a spirit may lose his way in the darkness go quickly now or be killed he turned and walked off not looking back michelson stood in the ancient street tall gaunt feet planted wide hands in pockets watching the webfoot until he was out of sight beyond a huge circular building there was a man to watch there was one of the intelligent ones one look into the alert old eyes had told him that michelson shook his head and went about satisfying his curiosity he entered buildings without thought of roofs falling in or decayed floors dropping from under his weight he began to collect small items making a pile of them in the street an ancient bowl metal untouched by the ages a statue of a man one foot high correct to the minutest detail showing how identical they had been to earthmen he found books still standing on ancient shelves but was afraid to touch them without tools darkness came swiftly and he was forced out into the street he stood there alone feeling the age of the place even the smell of age was in the air silver moonlight from the two moons filtered through clear air down upon the ruins the city lay now in darkness dead and still waiting for morning so it could lie dead and still in the sun there was no hurry to be going home although he was alone although this was alpha centaurus too with many unknowns many dangers although home was a very great distance away there was no one back there to worry about him his wife had died many years ago back on earth no children his friends in the settlement would not look for him for another day at least anyway the tiny cylinder buried in flesh behind his ear a thing of mystery and immense power could take him home instantly without effort save for a flicker of thought you did not leave as i asked you michelson whirled around at the sound of the native's voice then he relaxed he said you shouldn't sneak up on a man like that you must leave or i will be forced to kill you i do not want to kill you but if i must he made a clucking sound deep in the throat the spirits are angry nonsense superstition but never mind you have been here longer than i tell me what are those instruments in the rooms it looks like a clock but i'm certain it had some other function what rooms oh come now the small rooms back there look like they were bedrooms i do not know the webfoot drew closer michelson decided he was sixty or seventy years old at least you've been here a long time you are intelligent and you must be educated the way you talk that gadget looks like a timepiece of some sort what is it what does it measure i insist that you go the webfoot held something in his hand no michelson looked off down the street trying to ignore the native trying to feel the life of the city as it might have been you are sensitive the native said in his ear it takes a sensitive god to feel the spirits moving in the houses and walking in these old streets say it any way you want to this is the most fascinating thing i've ever seen the inca's treasure the ruins of pompeii egyptian tombs none can hold a candle to this mr earth god 
don't call me that i'm not a god and you know it the old man shrugged it is not an item worthy of dispute those names you mentioned are they the then names of gods he chuckled in a way yes what is your name maota you must help me maota these things must be preserved we'll build a museum right here in the street no over there on the hill just outside the city we'll collect all the old writings and perhaps we may decipher them think of it maota to read pages written so long ago and think their thoughts we'll put everything under glass build and evacuate chambers to stop the decay catalogue itemize michelson was warming up to his subject but maota shook his head like a waving palm frond and stamped his feet you will leave now can't you see look at the decay these things are priceless they must be preserved future generations will thank us do you mean the old man asked aghast that you want others to come here you know the city abhors the sound of alien voices those who lived here may return one day they must not find their city packaged and preserved and laid out on shelves for the curious to breathe their foul breaths upon you will leave now no michelson was adamant the rock of gibraltar maota hit him quickly passionately and dropped the weapon beside his body he turned swiftly making a swirling mark in the sand with his heel and walked off toward the hills outside the city the weapon he had used was an ancient book its paper-thin pages rustled in the wind as if an unseen hand turned them reading while michelson's blood trickled out from the head wound upon the ancient street when he regained consciousness the two moons bright sentinel orbs in the night sky had moved to a new position down their sliding path old maota's absence took some of the weirdness and fantasy away it seemed a more practical place now the gash in his head was painful throbbing with quick short hammer blows synchronized with his heartbeats but there was a new determination in him if it was a fight that the old web-footed fool wanted a fight he would get the cylinder flicked him at his command across five hundred miles of desert and rocks to a small creek he remembered here he bathed his head in cold water until all the caked blood was dissolved from his hair feeling better he went back the wind had turned cool michelson shivered wishing he had brought a coat the city was absolutely still except for small gusts of wind sighing through the frail spires the ancient book still lay in the sand beside the dark spot of blood he stooped over and picked it up it was light much lighter than most earth books he ran a hand over the binding smooth it was untouched by time or climate he squinted at the pages tilting the book to catch the bright moonlight but the writing was alien he touched the page ran his forefinger over the writing suddenly he sprang back the book fell from his hands god in heaven he exclaimed he had heard a voice he looked around at the old buildings down the length of the ancient street something strange about the voice not maota not his tones not his words satisfied that no one was near he stooped and picked up the book again good god he said aloud it was the book talking his fingers had touched the writing again it was not a voice exactly but a stirring in his mind like a strange language heard for the first time a talking book what other surprises were in the city tall fragile buildings laughing at time and weather a clock measuring god knows what if such wonders remained what about those already destroyed one could only guess at the machines the gadgets the artistry already decayed and blown away to mix forever with the sand 
i must preserve it he thought whether mayoto likes it or not they say these people lived half a million years ago a long time let's see now a man lives one hundred years on the average five thousand lifetimes and all you do is touch a book and a voice jumps across all those years he started off toward the tall building he had examined upon discovery of the city his left eyelid began to twitch and he laid his forefinger against the eye pressing until it stopped then he stooped and entered the building he laid the book down and tried to take the clock off the wall it was dark in the building and his fingers felt along the wall looking for it then he touched it his fingers moved over the smooth surface then suddenly he jerked his hand back with an exclamation of amazement fear ran up his spine the clock was warm he felt like running like flicking back to the settlement where there were people and familiar voices for here was a thing that should not be half a million years and here was warmth he touched it again curiosity overwhelming his fear it was warm no mistake and there was a faint vibration a suggestion of power he stood there in the darkness staring off into the darkness trembling fear built up in him until it was a monstrous thing drowning reason he forgot the power of the cylinder behind his ear he scrambled through the doorway he got up and ran down the ancient sandy street until he came to the edge of the city here he stopped gasping for air feeling the pain throb in his head common sense said that he should go home that nothing worth while could be accomplished at night that he was tired that he was weak from loss of blood and fright and running but when michelson was on the trail of important discoveries he had no common sense he sat down in the darkness meaning to rest a moment when he awoke dawn was red against thin clouds in the east old maota stood in the street with webbed feet planted far apart in the sand a weapon in the crook of his arm it was a long tube affair familiar to michelson michelson asked did you sleep well no i'm sorry to hear that how do you feel fine but my head aches a little sorry maota said for what for hitting you pain is not for gods like you michelson relaxed somewhat what kind of man are you first you try to break my skull then you apologize i abhor pain i should have killed you outright he thought about that for a moment i the weapon it looked in good working order slim and shiny and innocent it looked like a glorified african blow-gun but he was not deceived by its appearance it was a deadly weapon well he said before you kill me tell me about the book he held it up for maota to see what about the book what kind of book is it what does mr earth god mean what kind of book you have seen it it is like any other book except for the material and the fact that it talks no no i mean what's in it poetry poetry for god's sake why poetry why not mathematics or history why not tell how to make the metal of the book itself now there is a subject worthy of a book maota shook his head one does not study a dead culture to learn how they made things but how they thought but we are wasting time i must kill you now so i can get some rest the old man raised the gun wait you forgot that i also have a weapon he pointed to the spot behind his ear where the cylinder was buried i can move faster than you can fire the gun maota nodded i have heard how you trouble it does not matter i will kill you anyway i suggest we negotiate no why not maota looked off toward the hills old eyes filmed from years of sand and wind leather skin lined and pitted the hills stood immobile brown-gray 
already shimmering with heat impotent why not michelson repeated why not what Mayota dragged his eyes back negotiate no Mayota's eyes grew hard as steel they stood there in the sun not twenty feet apart hating each other the two moons very pale and far away on the western horizon stared like two bottomless eyes all right then at least it's a quick death i hear that thing just disintegrates a man <laughs> and that's that michelson prepared himself to move if the old man's finger slid closer toward the firing stud the old man raised the gun wait now what at least read some of the book to me before i die then the gun wavered i am not an unreasonable man the webfoot said michelson stepped forward extending his arm with the book no stay where you are throw it this book is priceless you just don't go throwing such valuable items around it won't break throw it michelson threw the book it landed at Mayota's feet spouting sand against his leg he shifted the weapon picked up the book and leaped through it raising his head in a listening attitude searching for a suitable passage michelson heard the thin metallic pages rustle softly he could have jumped and seized the weapon at that moment but his desire to hear the book was strong old Mayoto read michelson listened the cadence was different the syntax confusing but the thoughts were there it might have been a professor back on earth reading to his students keats shelley browning these people were human with human thoughts and aspirations the old man stopped reading he squatted slowly keeping michelson in sight and laid the book face up in the sand wind moved the pages see he said the spirits read they must have been great readers these people they drink the book as if it were an elixir see how gentle they lap at the pages like a new kitten tasting milk michelson laughed you certainly have an imagination what difference does it make Mayota cried suddenly angry you want to close up all these things in boxes for a posterity who may have no slightest feeling or appreciation i want to leave the city as it is for spirits whose existence i cannot prove the old man's eyes were furious now deadly the gun came down directly in line with the earthman's chest the gnarled finger moved michelson using the power of the cylinder behind his ear jumped behind the old webfoot to Mayota it seemed that he had flicked out of existence like a match blown out the next instant michelson spun him around and hit him it was an inexpert fist belonging to an archaeologist not a fighter but Mayota was an old man he dropped in the sand momentarily stunned michelson bent over to pick up the gun and the old man feeling it slip from his fingers hung on and was pulled to his feet they struggled for possession of the gun silently gasping kicking sand faces grew red lips drew back over michelson's white teeth over Mayota's pink toothless gums the dead city's fragile spires threw impersonal shadows down where they fought then quite suddenly a finger or hand neither knew whose finger or hand touched the firing stud there was a hollow whooshing sound both stopped still realizing the total destruction they might have caused it only hit the ground michelson said a black charred hole two feet in diameter and they could not see how deep stared at them Mayota let go and sprawled in the sand the book he cried the book is gone no we probably covered it with sand while we fought both men began scooping sand in their cupped hands digging frantically for the book saliva dripped from Mayota's mouth but he didn't know or care finally they stopped exhausted they had covered a substantial area around the hole they had covered the complete area where they had been 
we killed it the old man moaned it was just a book not alive you know how do you know the old man's pale eyes were filled with tears it talked and it sang in a way it had a soul sometimes on long nights i used to imagine it loved me for taking care of it there are other books we'll get another Mayota shook his head there are no more but i've seen them down there in the square building not poetry books yes but not poetry that was the only book with songs i'm sorry you killed it Mayota suddenly sprang for the weapon lying forgotten in the sand michelson put his foot on it and Mayota was too weak to tear it loose he could only weep out his rage when he could talk again Mayota said i am sorry mr earth god i've disgraced myself don't be sorry michelson helped him to his feet we fight for some reasons cry for others a priceless book is a good reason for either not for that for not winning i should have killed you last night when i had the chance the gods give us chances and if we don't take them we lose for ever i told you before we are on the same side negotiate have you never heard of negotiation you are a god Mayota said one does not negotiate with gods one either loves them or kills them that's another thing i am not a god can't you understand of course you are Mayota looked up very sure mortals cannot step from star to star like crossing a shallow brook no no i don't step from one star to another an invention does that just an invention i carry it with me it's a tiny thing no one would ever guess it has such power so you see i'm human just like you hit me and i hurt cut me and i bleed i love i hate i was born some day i'll die see i'm human just a human with a machine no more than that Mayota laughed then sobered quickly you lie no if i had this machine could i travel as you yes then i'll kill you and take yours it would not work for you why each machine is tailored for each person the old man hung his head he looked down into the black charred hole he walked all around the hole he kicked at the sand looking half-heartedly again for the book look michelson said i'm sure i've convinced you that i'm human why not have a try at negotiating our differences he looked up his expressive eyes deep resigned studied michelson's face finally he shook his head sadly when we first met i hoped we could think the ancient thoughts together but our paths diverge we have finished you and i he turned and started off shoulders slumped dejectedly michelson caught up to him are you leaving the city no where are you going away far away Mayota looked off toward the hills eyes distant don't be stupid old man how can you go far away and not leave the city there are many directions you would not understand east west north south up down no no there is another direction come if you must see michelson followed him far down the street they came to a section of the city he had not seen before buildings were smaller spires dwarfed against larger structures here a path was packed in the sand leading to a particular building michelson said this is where you live yes Mayota went inside michelson stood in the entrance and looked around the room was clean furnished with handmade chairs and a bed who is this old man he thought far from his people living alone choosing a life of solitude among ancient ruins but not touching them above the bed a clock was fastened to the wall michelson remembered his fright thinking of the warmth where warmth should not be 
Miyota pointed to it. You asked about this machine, he said. Now I will tell you. He laid his hand against it. Here is power to follow another direction. Michelson tested one of the chairs to see if it would hold his weight, then sat down. His curiosity about the instrument was colossal, but he forced a short laugh. Miyota, you are complex. Why not stop all this mystery nonsense and tell me about it? You know more about it than I. Of course, Miyota smiled a toothless superior smile. What do you suppose happened to this race? You tell me. They took the unknown direction. The books speak of it. I don't know how the instrument works, but one thing is certain. The race did not die out as a species becomes extinct michelson was amused but interested something like a fourth dimension i don't know i only know that with this instrument there is no death i have read the books that speak of this race this wonderful people who conquered all disease who explored all the mysteries of science who devised this machine to cheat death see this button here on the face of the instrument press the button and and what i don't know exactly but i have lived many years i have walked the streets of this city and wondered and wanted to press the button now i will do so quickly the old man still smiling pressed the button a high-pitched whine filled the air just within audio range steady for a moment it then rose in pitch passing beyond hearing quickly the old man's knees buckled he sank down fell over the bed lay still michelson touched him cautiously then examined him more carefully no question about it the old man was dead feeling depressed and alone michelson found a desert knoll outside the city overlooking the tall spires that shone in the sunlight and gleamed in the moonlight he made a stretcher rolled the old man's body onto it and dragged it down the long ancient street and up the knoll here he buried him but it seemed a waste of time somehow he knew beyond any doubt that the old native and his body were completely disassociated in some sense more complete than death in the days that followed he gave much thought to the clock he came to the city every day he spent long hours in the huge square building with the books he learned the language by sheer bulldog determination then he searched the books for information about the instrument finally after many weeks long after the winds had obliterated all evidence of Mayota's grave on the knoll michelson made a decision he had to know if the machine would work for him and so one afternoon when the ancient spires threw long shadows over the sand he walked down the long street and entered the old man's house he stood before the instrument trembling afraid but determined he pinched his eyes shut tight like a child and pressed the button the high-pitched whine started complete utter silence void darkness awareness and memory yes nothing else then Mayota's chuckle came no sound an impression only like the voice from the ancient book where was he there was no left or right up or down mayota was everywhere nowhere look mayota's thought was directed at him in this place of no direction think of the city and you will see it michelson did and he saw the city beyond as if he were looking through a window and yet he was in the city looking at his own body mayota's chuckle again the city will remain as it is you did not win after all neither did you but this existence has compensations mayota said you can be anywhere see anywhere on this planet even on your earth michelson felt a great sadness seeing his body lying across the old homemade bed he looked closer he sensed a vibration or life force he didn't stop to define it in his body why was his dead body different from old mayota's could it be that there was some thread stretching from the reality of his body 
to his present state no one can go back i don't like your thoughts Mayota said no one can go back i tried i have discussed it with many who are not presently in communication with you no one can go back michelson decided he'd try no no Mayota's thought was prickled with fear and anger michelson did not know how to try but he remembered the cylinder and gathered all the force of his mind in spite of Mayota's protests and gave his most violent command at first he thought it didn't work he got up and looked around then it struck him he was standing up the cylinder he knew it was the cylinder that was the difference between himself and Mayota. when he used the cylinder that was where he went the place where Mayota was now it was a door of some kind leading to a path of some kind where distance was non-existent but the clock was a mechanism to transport only the mind to that place to be certain of it he pressed the button again with the same result as before he saw his own body fall down he felt Mayota's presence you devil Mayota's thought scream was a sort of hate and anger irrational suddenly like a person who knows his loss is irrevocable i said you were a god i said you were a god i said you were a god End of a city near centaurus by bill Doy. man of distinction by michael shara this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard man of distinction by michael shara being unique is a matter of pride but being a complete mathematical impossibility the remarkable distinction of thatcher blit did not come to the attention of a bemused world until late in the year twenty one eighty although thatcher blit was by the standards of his time an extremely successful man financially this was not considered real distinction unfortunately for blit it never has been the history books do not record the names of the most successful merchants of the past unless they happen by chance to have been connected with famous men of the time thus croesus is remembered largely for his contributions to famous romans and successful armies and heim solomon a similarly wealthy man would have been long forgotten had he not also been a financial mainstay of the american revolution and concerted with famous if impoverished statesmen so if thatcher blit was distinct among men the distinction was not immediately apparent he was a small gaunt fragile man who had kind face and bearing that are perfect for movie crowd scenes absolutely forgettable yet thatcher blit was one of the most foremost businessmen of his time for he was president and founder of that noble institution genealogy incorporated thatcher blit was not yet twenty-five when he made the discovery which was to make him among the richest men of his time his discovery was like all great ones obvious yet profound he observed that every person had a father carrying on with this thought it followed inevitably that every father had a father and so on in fact thought blit when you considered the matter rightly everyone alive was the direct descendant of untold numbers of fathers down through the ages all descending one after another father to son and so backward unquestionably into the unrecognizable and perhaps simian fathers of the past this thought on the face of it not particularly profound struck young blit like a blow he saw that since each man had a father and so on and so on it ought to be possible to construct the genealogy of every person now alive in short it should be possible to trace your family back father by father to the beginning of time and of course it was for that was the era 
of the time scanner and with a time scanner it would be possible to document your family tree with perfect accuracy you could find out exactly from whom you had sprung and so thatcher blit made his fortune he saw clearly at the beginning what most of us see only now and he patented it he was aware not only of the deep-rooted sense of snobbishness that exists in many people but also of the simple yet profound force of curiosity who exactly one says to oneself was my forty times great-great-grandfather a roman legionary a viking a pyramid builder one of xenophon's ten thousand or was he perhaps for it is always possible alexander the great thatcher blit had a product to sell and sell he did for other reasons that he alone had noted at the beginning the races of mankind have twisted and turned with incredible complexity over the years the numbers of people have been enormous with thirty thousand years in which to work it was impossible that there was not somewhere along the line a famous ancestor for everybody a minor king would often suffice or even a general in some forgotten army and if these direct ancestors were not enough it was fairly simple to establish close blood kinship with famous men the blood lines of man you see began with a very few people in all of ancient greece in the time of pericles there were only a few thousand families seeing all this thatcher blit became a busy man it was necessary not only to patent his idea but to produce the enormous capital needed to found a large organization the cost of the time scanner was at first prohibitive but gradually that obstacle was overcome only for thatcher to find that the government for many years prevented him from using it yet blit was indomitable and eventually after years of heart-rending waiting genealogy inc began operations it was a tremendous success within months the very name of the company and its taut slogan an ancestor for everybody became household words there was but one immediate drawback it soon became apparent without going back very far into the past it was sometimes impossible to tell who was really the next father in line the mothers were certain but the fathers were something else again this was a ponderable point but blit refused to be discouraged he set various electronic engineers to work on the impasse and a solution was found an ingenious device which tested blood electronically through the scanner based on the different sine waves of the blood groups saved the day that invention was the last push genealogy inc was ever to need it rolled on to become one of the richest and for a long time most exclusive corporations in the world yet it was still many years before thatcher blit himself had time to rest there were patent infringements to be fought new developments in the labs to be watched new ways to be found to make the long and arduous task of father tracing easier and more economical hence he was well past sixty when he at last had time to begin considering himself he had become by this time a moderately offensive man surrounded as he had been all these years by pomp and luxury by impressive names and extraordinary family trees he had succumbed at last he became unbearably name-conscious he began by regrouping his friends according to their ancestries his infrequent parties were characterized by his almost parliamentarian system of seating no doubt all this had been in thatcher blit to begin with it may well be in perhaps varying quantities in all of us but it grew with him prospered with him yet in all those years he never once inspected his own forebears you may well ask was he afraid one answers one does not know but at any rate the fact remains that thatcher blit at the age of sixty-seven was one of the few rich men in the world who did not know who exactly their ancestors had been and so at last we come to the day when thatcher blit was sitting alone in his office one languid hand 
drooped vacantly over his brow listening with deep satisfaction to the hum and click of the enormous operations which were going on in the building around him what moved him that day remains uncertain perhaps it was that from where he was sitting he could see row upon row of action pictures of famous men which had been taken from his time scanners or perhaps it was simply that this profound question had been growing at him had been gnawing at him all these years deeper and deeper and on this day broke out into the light but whatever the reason at eleven o two that morning he leapt vitally from his chair he summoned cathcart his chief assistant and gave him the immortal command cathcart he grated stung to the core of his being who am i cathcart rushed off to find out there followed some of the most taut and fateful days in the brilliant history of genealogy inc father tracing is of course a painstaking business but it was not long before word had begun to filter out to interested people the first interesting discovery made was a man called blot in eighteenth-century england no explanation was ever given for the name's alteration from blot to blit certain snide individuals took this to mean that the name had been changed as a means to avoid prosecution or some such and immediately began making light remarks about the blots on old blit's escutcheon this blot had the distinction of having been a wine cellar of considerable funds this reputedly did not sit well with thatcher blit merchants he snapped however successful are not worthy of note he wanted empire builders he wanted at the very least a name he had heard about a name that appeared in the histories his workers furiously scanned backed into the past months went by before the next name appeared in ninth century england there was a wandering minstrel named john last name unprintable who achieved considerable notoriety as a ballad singer before dying in a natural death in the boudoir of a lady of high fashion although the details of this man's life were of extreme interest they did not impress the old man he was on the contrary rather shaken a minstrel and a rogue to boot there were shake-ups in genealogy inc cathcart was replaced by a man named jukes a highly competent man despite his interesting family name jukes forged ahead full steam past the birth of christ no relation but he was well into ancient egypt before the search began to take on the nature of a crisis up until then there was simply nobody or to be more precise nobody but nobodies it was incredible all the laws of chance were against it but there was actually not a single ancestor of note and no way of faking one for thatcher blit couldn't be fooled by his own methods what there was was simply an unending line of peasants serfs an occasional foot soldier or leather worker past john the ballad singer there was no one at all worth reporting to the old man this situation would not continue of course there were so few families for men to spring from the entire gallic nation for example a great section of present-day france sprang from the family of one lone man in the north of france in the days before christ every native frenchman therefore was at least the son of a king it was impossible for thatcher blit to be less so the hunt went on from day to day past ancient greece past germo past the wheel and metals and farming and on even past all civilization outward and backward into the cold primordial wastes of northern germany and still there was nothing though jukes lived in daily fear of losing his job there was nothing to do but press on in germany he reduced blitz's ancestor to a slovenly little man who was one of only three men in the entire tribe or family one of three in an area which now contains millions but blitz's ancestor true to form was simply a member of the tribe as was his father before him yet onward it went 
westward back into the french caves southward into spain and across the unrecognizable mediterranean into a verdant north africa backward in time past even the cro-magnons and yet ever backward thirty thousand years thirty-five thousand with old blit reduced now practically to gibbering and still never an exceptional forebear there came a time when jukes had at last inevitably to face the old man he had scanned back as far as he could the latest ancestor he had unearthed for blit was a hairy creature who did not walk erect and yet even here blit refused to concede it may be he howled it must be that my ancestor was the first man to walk erect or light a fire to do something it was not until jukes pointed out that all those things had been already examined and found hopeless that blit finally gave in blit was a relative of course of the first man to stand erect the man with the first human brain but so was everybody else on the face of the earth there was truly nowhere else to explore what would be found now would be only the common history of mankind blit retired to his chambers and refused to be seen the story went the rounds as such stories will and it was then at last after forty thousand years of insignificance that the name of blit found everlasting distinction the story was picked up fully documented by psychologists and geneticists of the time and inserted into textbooks as a profound commentary on the forces of heredity the name of thatcher blit in particular has become famous has persisted until this day for he is the only man yet discovered or ever likely to be discovered with this particular distinction in forty thousand years of scanner recorded history the bloodline of blit or blot never once produced an exceptional man that record is unsurpassed End of man of distinction by michael shara the other now by murray leinster this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. the other now by murray leinster he knew his wife was dead because he'd seen her buried but it was only one possibility out of infinitely many it was self-evident nonsense if jimmy patterson had told anybody but haines calm men in white jackets would have taken him away for psychiatric treatment which undoubtedly would have been effective he'd have been restored to sanity and common sense and he'd probably have died of it so to anyone who liked jimmy and jane it is good that things worked out as they did the facts are patently impossible but they are satisfying haines though would like very much to know exactly why it happened in the case of jimmy and jane and nobody else there must have been some specific reason but there's absolutely no clue to it it began about three months after jane was killed in that freak accident jimmy had taken her death hard this night seemed no different from any other he came home just as usual and his throat tightened a little just as usual as he went up to the door it was still intolerable to know that jane wouldn't be waiting for him the hurt in his throat was a familiar sensation which he was doggedly hoping would go away but it was extra strong to-night and he wondered rather desperately if he'd sleep or if he did whether he would dream sometimes he had dreams of jane and was happy until he woke up and then he wanted to cut his throat but he wasn't at that point to-night not yet as he explained it to haines later he simply put his key in the door and opened it and started to walk in but he kicked the door instead so he absently put his key in the door and opened it and started to walk in yes that is what happened he was halfway through before he realized he stared blankly the door looked perfectly normal he closed it behind him feeling queer 
he tried to reason out what had happened then he felt a slight draught the door wasn't shut it was wide open he had to close it again that was all that happened to mark this night off from any other and there is no explanation why it happened began rather this night instead of another jimmy went to bed with a taut feeling he'd had the conviction that he opened the door twice the same door then he had the conviction that he had had to close it twice he'd heard of that feeling queer but no doubt commonplace he slept blessedly without dreams he woke next morning and found his muscles tense that was an acquired habit before he opened his eyes every morning he reminded himself that jane wasn't beside him it was necessary if he forgot and turned contentedly to emptiness the ache of being alive when jane wasn't was unbearable this morning he lay with his eyes closed to remind himself and instead found himself thinking about that business of the door he kicked the door between the two openings so it wasn't only an illusion of repetition he was puzzling over that repetition after closing the door when he found he had to close it again that proved to him it wasn't a standard mental vagary it looked like a delusion but his memory insisted that it had happened that way whether it was possible or not frowning he went out and got his breakfast at a restaurant and rode to work work was blessed because he had to think about it the main trouble was that sometimes something turned up which jane would have been amused to hear and he had to remind himself that there was no use making a mental note to tell her jane was dead Today he thought a good deal about the door but when he went home he knew that he was going to have a black night he wouldn't sleep and oblivion would seem infinitely tempting because the ache of being alive when jane wasn't was horribly tedious and he could not imagine an end to it tonight would be a very bad one indeed he opened the door and started in he went crashing into the door he stood still for an instant and then fumbled for the lock but the door was open he'd opened it there hadn't been anything for him to run into yet his forehead hurt where he bumped into the door which wasn't closed at all there was nothing he could do about it though he went in he hung up his coat he sat down wearily he filled his pipe and grimly faced a night that was going to be one of the worst he struck a match and lighted his pipe and put the match in an ash tray and he glanced in the tray there were the stubs of cigarettes in it jane's brand freshly smoked he touched them with his fingers they were real then a furious anger filled him maybe the cleaning woman had had the intolerable insolence to smoke jane's cigarettes he got up and stormed through the house raging as he searched for signs of further impertinence he found none he came back seething to his chair the ashtray was empty and there'd been nobody around to empty it it was logical to question his own sanity and the question gave him a sort of grim cheer the matter of the recurrent oddities could be used to fight the abysmal depression ahead he tried to reason them out and always they added up to delusions only but he kept his mind resolutely on the problem work during the day was a godsend sometimes he was able to thrust aside for whole half-hours the fact that jane was dead now he grappled relievedly with the question of his sanity or lunacy he went to the desk where jane had kept her household accounts he'd set the whole thing down on paper and examine it methodically checking this item against that jane's diary lay on the desk blotter with a pencil between two of its pages he picked it up with a tug of dread some day he might read it an absurd chronicle jane had never offered him but not now not now that was when he realized that it shouldn't be here his hands jumped and it fell open he saw jane's angular writing and it hurt he closed it quickly aching all over but the printed date at the top of the page registered on his brain even as he snapped the cover shut he sat still for minutes every muscle taut it was a long time before he opened the book again 
and by that time he had a perfectly reasonable explanation it must be that jane hadn't restricted herself to assigned spaces when she had something extra to write she wrote it on past the page allotted for a given date of course jimmy fumbled back to the last written page where the pencil had been with a tense matter-of-factness it was as he'd noticed today's date the page was filled the writing was fresh it was jane's handwriting went to the cemetery said the sprawling letters it was very bad three months since the accident and it doesn't get any easier i'm developing a personal enmity to chance it doesn't seem like an abstraction any more it was chance that killed jimmy it could have been me instead or neither of us i wish jimmy went quietly mad for a moment or two when he came to himself he was staring at an empty desk blotter there wasn't any book before him there wasn't any pencil between his fingers he remembered picking up the pencil and writing desperately under jane's entry jane he'd written and he could remember the look of his scrawled script under jane's where are you i'm not dead i thought you were in god's name where are you but certainly nothing of the sort could have happened it was delusion that night was particularly bad but curiously not as bad as some other nights had been jimmy had a normal man's horror of insanity yet this wasn't so to speak normal insanity a lunatic has always an explanation for his delusions jimmy had none he noted the fact next morning he bought a small camera with a flash bulb attachment and carefully memorized the directions for its use this was the thing that would tell the story and that night when he got home as usual after dark he had the camera ready he unlocked the door and opened it he put his hand out tentatively the door was still closed he stepped back and quickly snapped the camera there was a sharp flash of the bulb the glare blinded him but when he put out his hand again the door was open he stepped into the living room without having to unlock and open it a second time he looked at the desk as he turned the film and put in a new flash bulb it was as empty as he'd left it in the morning he hung up his coat and settled down tensely with his pipe presently he knocked out the ashes there were cigarette butts in the tray he quivered a little he smoked again carefully not looking at the desk it was not until he knocked out the second pipeful of ashes that he let himself look where jane's diary had been it was there again the book was open there was a ruler laid across it to keep it open jimmy wasn't frightened and he wasn't hopeful there was absolutely no reason why this should happen to him he was simply desperate and grim when he went across the room he saw yesterday's entry and his own hysterical message and there was more writing beyond that in jane's hand darling maybe i'm going crazy but i think you wrote me as if you were alive maybe i'm crazy to answer you but please darling if you are alive somewhere and somehow there was a tear blot here the rest was frightened and tender and as desperate as jimmy's own sensations he wrote with trembling fingers before he put the camera into position and pressed the shutter control for the second time when his eyes recovered from the flash there was nothing on the desk he did not sleep at all that night nor did he work the next day he went to a photographer with the film and paid an extravagant fee to have the film developed and enlarged at once he got back two prints quite distinct even very clear considering everything one looked like a trick shot showing a door twice once open and once closed in the same photograph the other was a picture of an open book and he could read every word on its pages it was inconceivable that such a picture should have come out he walked around practically at random for a couple of hours looking at the pictures from time to time pictures or no pictures the thing was nonsense the facts were preposterous it must be that he only imagined seeing these prints but there was a quick way to find out he went to haines 
haynes was his friend and reluctantly a lawyer reluctantly because law practice interfered with a large number of unlikely hobbies haynes said jimmy quietly i want you to look at a couple of pictures and see if you see what i do i may have gone out of my head he passed over the picture of the door it looked to jimmy like two doors nearly at right angles in the same door frame and hung from the same hinges haynes looked at it and said tolerantly didn't know you went in for trick photography he picked up a reading glass and examined it in detail a futile but highly competent job you covered half the film and exposed with the door closed and then exposed for the other half of the film with the door open a neat job of matching though you've a good tripod i held the camera in my hand said jimmy with restraint you couldn't do it that way jimmy objected haines don't try to kid me i'm trying not to fool myself said jimmy he was very pale he handed over the other enlargement what do you see in this haines looked then he jumped he read through what was so plainly photographed on the pages of a diary that hadn't been before the camera then he looked at jimmy in palpable uneasiness got any explanation asked jimmy he swallowed i haven't any he told what had happened to date baldly and without any attempt to make it reasonable haines gaped at him but before long the lawyer's eyes grew shrewd and compassionate as noted hitherto he had a number of unlikely hobbies among which was a loud insistence on a belief in a fourth dimension and other esoteric ideas because it was good fun to talk authoritatively about them but he had common sense had haines and a good and varied law practice presently he said gently if you want it straight jimmy i had a client once she accused a chap of beating her up it was very pathetic she was absolutely sincere she really believed it but her own family admitted that she'd made the marks on herself and the doctors agreed that she'd unconsciously blotted it out of her mind afterward you suggest said jimmy composedly that i might have forged all that to comfort myself with as soon as i could forget the forging i don't think that's the case haines what possibilities does that leave haines hesitated a long time he looked at the pictures again scrutinizing especially the one that looked like a trick shot this is an amazingly good job of matching he said wryly i can't pick the place where the two exposures join some people might manage to swallow this and the theoretic explanation is a lot better the only trouble is that it couldn't happen jimmy waited haines went on awkwardly the accident in which jane was killed you were in your car you came up behind a truck carrying structural steel there was a long slim girder sticking way out behind with a red rag on it the truck had air brakes the driver jammed them on just after he'd passed over a bit of wet pavement the truck stopped your car slid even the brakes locked it's nonsense jimmy i'd rather you continued said jimmy white you ran into the truck your car swinging a little as it slid the garter came through the windshield it could have hit you it could have missed both of you by pure chance it happened to hit jane and killed her said jimmy very quietly yes but it might have been me that diary entry is written as if it had been me did you notice there was a long pause in haines office the world outside the windows was highly prosaic and commonplace and normal haines wriggled in his chair i think he said unhappily you did the same as my girl client forged that writing and then forgot it have you seen a doctor yet i will said jimmy systematize my lunacy for me first haines if it can be done it's not accepted science said haines in fact it's considered eyewash but there have been speculations he grimaced first point is that it was pure chance that jane was hit it was just as likely to be you instead or neither of you 
if it had been you jane said jimmy would be living in our house alone and she might very well have written that entry in the diary yes agreed haines uncomfortably i shouldn't suggest this but there are a lot of possible futures we don't know which one will come about for us nobody except fatalists can argue with that statement when today was in the future there were a lot of possible todays the present moment now is only one of any number of nows that might have been so it's been suggested mind you this isn't accepted science but pure charlatanry it's been suggested that there may be more than one actual now before the girder actually hit there were three nows in the possible future one in which neither of you was hit one in which you were hit and one he paused embarrassed so some people would say how do we know that the one in which jane was hit is the only now they'd say that the others could have happened and that maybe they did jimmy nodded if that were true he said detachedly jane would be in a present moment a now where it was me who was killed as i'm in a now where she was killed is that it hans shrugged jimmy thought and said gravely thanks queer isn't it he picked up the two pictures and went out haines was the only one who knew about the affair and he worried but it is not easy to denounce someone as insane when there is no evidence that he is apt to be dangerous he did go to the trouble to find out that jimmy acted in a reasonably normal manner working industriously and talking quite sanely in the daytime only haines suspected that of nights he went home and experienced the impossible sometimes haines suspected that the impossible might be the fact that that had been an amazingly good bit of trick photography but it was too preposterous also there was no reason for such a thing to happen to jimmy for a week after haines pseudo-scientific explanation however jimmy was almost light-hearted he no longer had to remind himself that jane was dead he had evidence that she wasn't she wrote to him in the diary which he found on her desk and he read her messages and wrote in return for a full week the sheer joy of simply being able to communicate with each other was enough the second week was not so good to know that jane was alive was good but to be separated from her without hope was not there was no meaning in a cosmos in which one could only write love letters to one's wife or husband in another now which only might have been but for a while both jimmy and jane tried to hide this new hopelessness from each other jimmy explained this carefully to haines before it was all over their letters were tender and very natural and presently there was even time for gossip and actual bits of choice scandal haines met jimmy on the street one day after about two weeks jimmy looked better but he was drawn very fine though he greeted haines without constraint haines felt awkward after a little he said uh jimmy that matter we were talking about the other day those photographs yes you were right said jimmy casually jane agrees there is more than one now in the now i'm in jane was killed in the now she's in i was killed haines fidgeted would you let me see that picture of the door again he asked a trick film like that simply can't be perfect i'd like to enlarge that picture a little more may i you can have the film said jimmy i don't need it any more haines hesitated jimmy quite matter-of-factly told him most of what had happened to date but he had no idea what had started it haines almost wrung his hands the thing can't be he said desperately you have to be crazy jimmy but he would not have said that to a man whose sanity he really suspected jimmy nodded jane told me something by the way did you have a near accident night before last somebody almost ran into you out on the sawmill road haines started and went pale 
i went around a curve and a car plunged out of nowhere on the wrong side of the road we both swung hard he smashed my fender and almost went off the road himself but he went racing off without stopping to see if i'd gone in the ditch and killed myself if i'd been five feet nearer the curb when he came out of it where jane is said jimmy you were just about five feet nearer the curb it was a bad smash tony shields was in the other car it killed him where jane is haines licked his lips it was absurd but he said how about me where jane is jimmy told him you're in the hospital haines swore in unreasonable irritation there wasn't any way for jimmy to know about that near accident he hadn't mentioned it because he'd no idea who'd been in the other car i don't believe it but he said pleadingly jimmy it isn't so is it how in hell could you account for it jimmy shrugged jane and i were rather fond of each other the understatement was so patent that he smiled faintly chance separated us the feeling we have for each other draws us together there is a saying about two people becoming one flesh if such a thing could happen it would be jane and me after all maybe only a tiny pebble or a single extra drop of water made my car swerve enough to get her killed where i am that is that's a very little thing so with such a trifle separating us and so much pulling us together why sometimes the barrier wears thin she leaves a door closed in the house where she is i open that same door where i am sometimes i have to open the door she left closed too that's all haines didn't say a word but the question he wouldn't ask was so self-evident that jimmy answered it we are hoping he said it's pretty bad being separated but the phenomena keep up so we hope her diary is sometimes in the now where she is and sometimes in this now of mine cigarette butts too maybe that was the only time he showed any sign of emotion he spoke as if his mouth were dry if ever i'm in her now or she's in mine even for an instant all the devils in hell couldn't separate us again we hope which was insanity in fact it was the third week of insanity he told haines quite calmly that jane's diary was on her desk every night and there was a letter to him in it and he wrote one to her he said quite calmly that the barrier between them seemed to be growing thinner that at least once when he went to bed he was sure that there was one more cigarette stub in the ashtray than had been there earlier in the evening they were very near indeed they were separated only by the difference between what was and what might have been in one sense the difference was a pebble or a drop of water in another the difference was that between life and death but they hoped they convinced themselves that the barrier grew thinner once it seemed to jimmy that they touched hands but he was not sure he was still sane enough not to be sure and he told all this to haines in a matter-of-fact fashion and speculated mildly on what had started it all then one night haines called jimmy on the telephone jimmy answered he sounded impatient jimmy said haines he was almost hysterical i think i'm insane you know you said tony shields was in the car that hit me yes said jimmy politely what's the matter it's been driving me crazy wailed haines feverishly you said he was killed there but i hadn't told a soul about the incident so so just now i broke down and phoned him and it was tony shields that near crash scared him to death and i gave him hell and he's paying for my fender i didn't tell him he was killed jimmy didn't answer it didn't seem to matter to him i'm coming over said haines feverishly i've got to talk no said jimmy jane and i are pretty close to each other we've touched each other again we're hoping the barriers wearing through we hope it's going to break 
but it can't protested haines shocked at the idea of improbabilities and the preposterous it it can't would it happen if you turned up where she is or or if she turned up here i don't know said jim but we'd be together you're crazy you mustn't good-bye said jimmy politely i'm hoping haines something has to happen it has to his voice stopped there was a noise in the room behind him haines heard it only two words and those faintly and over a telephone but he swore to himself that it was jane's voice throbbing with happiness the two words haines thought he heard were jimmy darling then the telephone crashed to the floor and haines heard no more even though he called back frantically again jimmy didn't answer haines sat up all that night practically gibbering and he tried to call jimmy again next morning and then he tried his office and at last went to the police he explained to them that jimmy had been in a highly nervous state since the death of his wife so finally the police broke into the house they had to break in because every door and window was carefully fastened from the inside as if jimmy had been very careful to make sure nobody could interrupt what he and jane hoped would occur but jimmy wasn't in the house there was no trace of him it was exactly as if he had vanished into the air ultimately the police dragged pawns and such things for his body but they never found any clues nobody ever saw jimmy again it was recorded that jimmy simply left town and everybody accepted that obvious explanation the thing that really bothered haines was the fact that jimmy had told him who'd almost crashed into him on the sawmill road and it was true that was to understate hard to take and there was the double exposure picture of jimmy's front door which was much more convincing than any other trick picture haines had ever seen but on the other hand if it did happen why did it happen only to jimmy and jane what set it off what started it why in effect did those oddities start at that particular time to those particular people in that particular fashion in fact did anything happen at all now after jimmy's disappearance haines wished he could talk with him once more talk sensibly quietly without fear and hysteria and this naggingly demanding wonderment for he had sketched to jimmy and jimmy had accepted hadn't he the possibility of the other now but with that acceptance came still others in one jane was dead in one jimmy was dead it was between these two that the barrier had grown so thin if he could talk to jimmy about it there was also a now in which both had died and another in which neither had died and if it was togetherness that each wanted so desperately which was it these were things that haines would have liked very much to know but he kept his mouth shut or calm men in white coats would have come and taken him away for treatment as they would have taken jimmy the only thing really sure was that it was all impossible but to someone who liked jimmy and jane and doubtless to jimmy and to jane themselves no matter which barrier had been broken it was a rather satisfying impossibility haines car had been repaired he could easily have driven out to the cemetery for some reason he never did end of the other now by murray leinster part one of the eyes have it by randall garrett this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. The Eyes Have It. Part One. Sir Pierre Morlay, Chevalier of the Angevin Empire, Knight of the Golden Leopard, and Secretary in Private to my Lord the Count de Vreau, pushed back the lace at his cuff for a glance at his wrist watch. 
three minutes of seven. The Angelus had rung at six, as always, and my Lord de Vreau had been awakened by it, as always. At least Sir Pierre could not remember any time in the past seventeen years when my Lord had not awakened at the Angelus. Once, he recalled, the sacristan had failed to ring the bell, and the Count had been furious for a week. Only the intercession of Father Bright, backed by the bishop himself, had saved the sacristan from doing a turn in the dungeons of Castle de Vreau. Sir Pierre stepped out into the corridor, walked along the carpeted flagstones, and cast a practiced eye around him as he walked. These old castles were difficult to keep clean, and my lord the Count was fussy about nitre collecting in the seams between the stones of the walls. All appeared quite in order, which was a good thing. My lord the Count had been making a night of it last evening, and that always made him the more peevish in the morning. Though he always woke at the Angelus, he did not always wake up sober. Sir Pierre stopped before a heavy, polished, carved oak door, selected a key from one of the many at his belt, and turned it in the lock. Then he went into the elevator and the door locked automatically behind him. He pressed the switch and waited in patient silence as he was lifted up four floors to the Count's personal suite. By now my lord the Count would have bathed, shaved, and dressed. He would also have poured down an eye-opener consisting of half a water-glass of fine champagne brandy. He would not eat breakfast until eight. The Count had no valet in the strict sense of the term. Sir Reginald Bowway held that title, but he was never called upon to exercise the more personal functions of his office. The Count did not like to be seen until he was thoroughly presentable. The elevator stopped. Sir Pierre stepped out into the corridor and walked along it toward the door at the far end. At exactly seven o'clock he rapped briskly on the great door which bore the gilt and polychrome arms of the House de Vreau. For the first time in seventeen years there was no answer. Sir Pierre waited for the growled command to enter for a full minute, unable to believe his ears. Then, almost timidly, he rapped again. There was still no answer. Then, bracing himself for the verbal onslaught that would follow if he had erred, Sir Pierre turned the handle and opened the door just as if he had heard the Count's voice telling him to come in. "'Good morning, my lord,' he said, as he always had for seventeen years. But the room was empty, and there was no answer. He looked around the huge room. The morning sunlight streamed in through the high, mullioned windows and spread a diamond-checkered pattern across the tapestry on the far wall, lighting up the brilliant hunting scene in a blaze of color. My lord? Nothing. Not a sound. The bedroom door was open. Sir Pierre walked across to it and looked in. He saw immediately why my lord the Count had not answered, and that, indeed, he would never answer again. My lord the Count lay flat on his back, his arms spread wide, his eyes staring at the ceiling. He was still clad in his gold and scarlet evening clothes. But the great stain on the front of his coat was not the same shade of scarlet as the rest of the cloth, and the stain had a bullet hole in its center. Sir Pierre looked at him without moving for a long moment. Then he stepped over, knelt, and touched one of the Count's hands with the back of his own. It was quite cool. He had been dead for hours. "'I knew someone would do you in sooner or later, my lord,' said Sir Pierre, almost regretfully. Then he rose from his kneeling position and walked out without another look at his dead lord. He locked the door of the suite, pocketed the key, and went back downstairs in the elevator. Mary Lady Duncan stared out of the window at the morning sunlight and wondered what to do. The Angelus Bell had awakened her from a fitful sleep in her chair, and she knew that, as a guest at Castle de Vreau, she would be expected to appear at Mass again this morning. But how could she? How could she face the sacramental Lord on the altar, to say nothing of taking the blessed sacrament itself? Still, it would look all the more conspicuous if she did not show up this morning after having made it a point to attend every morning with Lady Alice during the first four days of this visit. 
She turned and glanced at the locked and barred door of the bedroom. He would not be expected to come. Laird Duncan used his wheelchair as an excuse, but since he had taken up black magic as a hobby, he had, she suspected, been actually afraid to go anywhere near a church. If only she hadn't lied to him! But how could she have told the truth? That would have been worse, infinitely worse. And now, because of that lie, he was locked in his bedroom doing only God and the devil knew what. If only he would come out! If he would only stop doing whatever it was he had been doing for all these long hours, or at least finish it! Then they could leave Evro, make some excuse, any excuse, to get away. One of them could feign sickness, anything, anything to get them out of France, across the Channel, and back to Scotland, where they would be safe. She looked back out of the window, across the courtyard, at the towering stone walls of the great keep, and at the high window that opened into the suite of Edward, Count de Vreau. Last night she had hated him, but no longer. Now there was only room in her heart for fear. She buried her face in her hands and cursed herself for a fool. There were no tears left for weeping, not after the long night. Behind her she heard the sudden noise of the door being unlocked, and she turned. Laird Duncan of Duncan opened the door and wheeled himself out. He was followed by a malodorous gust of vapor from the room he had just left. Lady Duncan stared at him. He looked older than he had last night, more haggard and worn, and there was something in his eyes she did not like. For a moment he said nothing. Then he wet his lips with the tip of his tongue. When he spoke his voice sounded dazed. "'There is nothing to fear any more,' he said. "'Nothing to fear at all.'" The Reverend Father James Valois Bright, vicar of the chapel of Saint Esprit, had at his flock the several hundred inhabitants of the Castle de Vreau. As such he was the ranking priest socially, not hierarchically, in the country. Not counting the bishop and the chapter at the cathedral, of course. But such knowledge did little good for the father's peace of mind. The turnout of the flock was abominably small for its size, especially for weekday masses. The Sunday masses were well attended, of course. Count de Vreau was there punctually at nine every Sunday, and he had a habit of counting the house, but he never showed up on weekdays, and his laxity had allowed a certain further laxity to filter down through the ranks. The great consolation was Lady Alice de Vreau. She was a plain, simple girl, nearly twenty years younger than her brother the Count, and quite his opposite in every way. She was quiet where he was thundering, self-effacing where he was flamboyant, temperate where he was drunken, and chased where he was. Father Bright brought his thoughts to a full halt for a moment. He had, he reminded himself, no right to make judgments of that sort. He was not, after all, the Count's confessor, the bishop was. Besides, he should have his mind on his prayers just now. He paused and was rather surprised to notice that he had already put on his alb amice and girdle and he was aware that his lips had formed the words of the prayer as he had donned each of them. Habit, he thought, can be destructive to the contemplative faculty. He glanced around the sacristy. His server, the young son of the Count of saint brieuc sat there to complete his education as a gentleman who would some day be the king's governor of one of the most important counties in Brittany, was pulling his surplice down over his head. The clock said seven eleven. Father Bright forced his mind heavenward and repeated silently the vesting prayers that his lips had formed meaninglessly, this time putting his full intentions behind them. Then he added a short mental prayer asking God to forgive him for allowing his thoughts to stray in such a manner. He opened his eyes and reached for his chasuble just as the sacristy door opened, and Sir Pierre, the Count's privy secretary, stepped in. "'I must speak to you, father,' he said in a low voice. And, glancing at the young de saint he added, 
alone. Normally, Father Bright would have reprimanded anyone who presumed to break into the sacristy as he was vesting for Mass, but he knew that Sir Pierre would never interrupt without good reason. He nodded and went outside in the corridor that led to the altar. "'What is it, Pierre?' he asked. "'My lord the Count is dead. Murdered.' After the first momentary shock, Father Bright realized that the news was not, after all, totally unexpected. Somewhere in the back of his mind it seemed he had always known that the Count would die by violence long before debauchery ruined his health. "'Tell me about it,' he said quietly. Sir Pierre reported exactly what he had done and what he had seen. "'Then I locked the door and came straight here,' he told the priest. "'Who else has the key to the Count's suite?' Father Bright asked. "'No one but my lord himself,' Sir Pierre answered. "'At least as far as I know.' "'Where is his key?' "'Still in the ring at his belt. I noticed that particularly.' "'Very good. We'll leave it locked. You're certain the body was cold?' "'Cold and waxy, Father.' "'Then he's been dead many hours.' "'Lady Alice will have to be told,' Sir Pierre said. Father Bright nodded. "'Yes, the Countess de Vreau must be informed of her succession to the county seat.' He could tell by the sudden momentary blank look that came over Sir Pierre's face that the privy secretary had not yet realized fully the implications of the Count's death. "'I'll tell her, Pierre. She should be in her pew by now.' Just step into the church and tell her quietly that I want to speak to her. Don't tell her anything else. I understand, father," said Sir Pierre. There were only twenty-five or thirty people in the pews, most of them women, but Alice, Countess de Vreau, was not one of them. Sir Pierre walked quietly and unobtrusively down the side aisle and out into the narthex. She was standing there, just inside the main door adjusting the black lace mantilla about her head, as though she had just come in from outside. Suddenly Sir Pierre was very glad he would not have to be the one to break the news. She looked rather sad, as always, her plain face unsmiling. The jutting nose and square chin, which had given her brother the Count a look of aggressive handsomeness, only made her look very solemn and rather sexless, although she had a magnificent figure. My lady, Sir Pierre said, stepping towards her, the Reverend Father would like to speak to you before Mass. He's waiting at the sacristy door. She held her rosary clutched tightly to her breast and gasped. Then she said, Oh, Sir Pierre, I'm sorry. You quite surprised me. I didn't see you. My apologies, my lady. It's all right. My thoughts were elsewhere. Will you take me to the good Father? Father Bright heard their footsteps coming down the corridor before he saw them. He was a little fidgety because Mass was already a minute overdue. It should have started promptly at 7.15. The new Countess de Vreau took the news calmly, as he had known she would. After a pause she crossed herself and said, "'May his soul rest in peace. I will leave everything in your hands, Father, Sir Pierre. What are we to do?' Pierre must get on the teleson to Rouen immediately and report the matter to His Highness. I will announce your brother's death and ask for prayers for his soul, but I think I need say nothing about the manner of his death. There is no need to arouse any more speculation and fuss than necessary. Very well, said the Countess. Come, Sir Pierre, I will speak to the Duke, my cousin, myself. Yes, my lady. Father Bright returned to the sacristy, opened the missal, and changed the placement of the ribbons. Today was an ordinary feria. A votive mass would not be forbidden by the rubrics. The clock said 7.17. He turned to young de saint Briuc, who was waiting respectfully. "'Quickly, my son, go and get the unbleached beeswax candles and put them on the altar. Be sure you light them before you put out the white ones. Hurry now.' I will be ready by the time you come back. 
Oh, yes, and change the altar frontal. Put on the black. Yes, father. And the lad was gone. Father Bright folded the green chasuble and returned it to the drawer, then took out the black one. He would say a requiem for the souls of all the faithful departed, and hope that the Count was among them. His Royal Highness, the Duke of Normandy, looked over the official letter his secretary had just typed for him. It was addressed to Serenissus Simus Dominus Nostris Iohannus Quartus, de Gratia Angliae, Franciae, Scotiae, Hiberniae, et Nove Angliae, Rex Imperator, Fide Defensor. Our most serene Lord, John the Fourth, by the grace of God, King and Emperor of England, France, Scotland, Ireland, and New England, Defender of the Faith. It was a routine matter, simple notification to his brother, the King, that His Majesty's most faithful servant, Edward, Count of Evreux, had departed this life, and asking His Majesty's confirmation of the Count's heir at law, Alice, Countess of Evreux, as his lawful successor. His Highness finished reading, nodded, and scrawled his signature at the bottom, Richard Dux Normanier. Then, on a separate piece of paper, he wrote, Dear John, may I suggest you hold up on this for a while? Edward was a lecher and a slob, and I have no doubt he got everything he deserved, but we have no notion who killed him. For any evidence I have to the contrary, it might have been Alice who pulled the trigger. I will send you full particulars as soon as I have them. With much love, your brother and servant, Richard. He put both papers into a prepared envelope and sealed it. He wished he could have called the king on the teleson, but no one had yet figured out how to get the wires across the channel. He looked absently at the sealed envelope, his handsome blond features thoughtful. The house of Plantagenet had endured for eight centuries, and the blood of Henry of Anjou ran thin in its veins, but the Norman strain was as strong as ever having been replenished over the centuries by fresh infusions from Norwegian and Danish princesses. Richard's mother, Queen Helga, wife to his late majesty Henry X, spoke very few words of Anglo-French, and those with a heavy Norse accent. Nevertheless, there was nothing Scandinavian in the language, manner, or bearing of Richard, Duke of Normandy. Not only was he a member of the oldest and most powerful ruling family of Europe, but he bore a Christian name that was distinguished even in that family. Seven kings of the empire had borne the name, and most of them had been good kings, if not always good men in the nicey-nicey sense of the word. Even old Richard I, who had been pretty wild during the first forty-odd years of his life, had settled down to do a magnificent job of kinging for the next twenty years. The long and painful recovery from the wound he'd received at the siege of Chalouse had made a change in him for the better. There was a chance that Duke Richard might be called upon to uphold the honor of that name as king. By law, Parliament must elect a Plantagenet as king in the event of the death of the present sovereign, and while the election of one of the king's two sons, the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Lancaster, was more likely than the election of Richard, he was certainly not eliminated from the succession. Meantime, he would uphold the honor of his name as Duke of Normandy. Murder had been done. Therefore, justice must be done. The Count de Vreau had been known for his stern but fair justice, almost as well as he had been known for his profligacy. And just as his pleasures had been without temperance, so his justice had been untempered by mercy. Whoever had killed him would find both justice and mercy, in so far as Richard had it within his power to give it. Although he did not formulate it in so many words, even mentally, Richard was of the opinion that some debauched woman or cuckolded man had fired the fatal shot. Thus he found himself inclining toward mercy before he knew anything substantial about the case at all. Richard dropped the letter he was holding into the special mail pouch that would be placed aboard the evening trans-channel packet, and then turned in his chair to look at the lean, middle-aged man working at a desk across the room. "'My Lord Marquis,' he said thoughtfully. "'Yes, Your Highness?' 
said the Marquis of Rouen, looking up. How true are the stories one has heard about the late Count? True, your highness? the Marquis said thoughtfully. I would hesitate to make any estimate of percentages. Once a man gets a reputation like that, the number of his reputed sins quickly surpasses the number of actual ones. Doubtless many of the stories one hears are of whole cloth, others may have only a slight basis in fact. On the other hand, it is highly likely that there are many of which we have never heard. It is absolutely certain, however, that he has acknowledged seven illegitimate sons, and I dare say he has ignored a few daughters, and these, mind you, with unmarried women. His adulteries would be rather more difficult to establish, but I think your highness can take it for granted that such escapades were far from uncommon." He cleared his throat and then added, "'If your highness is looking for motive, I fear there is a superabundance of persons with motive.' "'I see,' the Duke said. "'Well, we will wait and see what sort of information Lord Darcy comes up with.' He looked up at the clock. "'They should be there by now.' Then, as if brushing further thoughts on the subject from his mind, he went back to work, picking up a new sheaf of state papers from his desk. The Marquis watched him for a moment and smiled a little to himself. The young Duke took his work seriously but was well balanced about it. A little inclined to be romantic, but aren't we all at nineteen? There was no doubt of his ability, nor of his nobility. The royal blood of England always came through. End of Part One